Okay, this is what we're going to be covering. Um, this is the table of contents. The, um, the rules of the road that I have in mind are, we're going we're gonna to hit these different slides, and in each one, I would encourage you, if it provokes any questions at all, please raise them. And we have our panel of experts sitting with me here, um, who, uh, and, and the number one expert of all, sitting over unobtrusively um, by the computer screen, uh, who will be able to field the questions and hopefully give you the answers that, that you're looking for. Well, maybe not the answers that you're looking for, but at least the answers to the questions that you ask. Um, so please, as soon as something comes to your mind, feel free to speak. Um, this is, I want it to be as interactive as, as you know, we can make it. So, um, this is where we're headed. Um, if you please. And this is a, um, is a slide that you may have seen before uh, Berlin, I think, may have pioneered this one. Um, it just shows that the budget is the result of, uh, I would say, a lot of dynamic pulling, hauling, negotiating, and the only thing missing from, well, the one big thing that I'm aware of that's missing from this slide is an, an hourglass held by, you know, a guy holding a reaper um, <laughs> as you are under the gun to actually get this done um, within a certain time frame. So, um, this is also the way, sort of the, the flow chart for how budgets are made. Um, the repeat as necessary part is is actually a, a, a real thing. I think um, pretty much every budget went through at least three iterations. Is that right, Lori? And one or two may have gone through five. Yes. Five. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> this is a very important kind of cyclical um, threshing, reviewing, rethinking, um, and then finally the board approves the budget. And then we worn it out to you voters for you to hopefully approve or at least express your, um, your view on, your yes or your no. So um, the, the top line summary of this budget broken down by school, essentially, as you can see, the, the, between the, the asterisks and the plus signs, each one of these numbers has been approved by voters in the town in which the school is located, and for U32 in the five-town U32 district. The one difference is special education expenses that are reimbursed at 100%. We have to show the gross amount for this merged budget. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, the actual education spending, the amount that we're taxed on, is exactly the same as the sum of all of the previously approved budgets from town meeting day or from April 25th. Seven. So, my name is Sandal Kate, and next year, is it going to be drastically different? Because will each school create a separate budget, and but then some, then everybody votes on it? I mean, how's, you know, this time around we approved that figure. Yes. Next year we won't be approving an individual figure, am I right in thinking that? Uh, individual school by school, you mean? Correct. Um, probably, I don't, this is something we're going to have to figure out over the course, you know, if this thing continues, something we'll have to figure out over the course of the year. Because whether we present it in a kind of school by school breakdown, I suspect that the budgets themselves 
were being developed you know, from the ground up, school by school. And, and Lori, I, I submit to your correction. Um, uh, but whether those school by school amounts are actually shown, or whether they're you know, combined into a single merged line item, um, I, my own preference would be to show school by school for you know, maximum transparency. So that uh, maybe someday voters will you know, be accustomed to seeing just the one line for everything. But for now, I think it's, it's important for voters to feel comfortable with whatever is. But only one vote. It's not town by town vote. Right, next year. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. 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 So, Rick? You know, I think this whole thing, you know, the whole big argument was equity among towns, you know, and, which is absolute horseman, or it's not equity any further. But I think we need to show those costs, at least for quite a while, you know on individual schools. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just need to see the numbers that are actually going, how they're being distributed, and that, why they're being distributed. Mm -hmm. And that, if there's going to be equity here, I mean, we need a double check on this somehow. I am not trusting, after the past, our experience over the past five years. I mean, I tell you, I, and you know I've been involved with this school for a long time, and I don't just say that lightly, but, you know, we need to have some serious, Accountability at a micro level. Understood, you know. and and I think I think that's what we'll be focusing on, especially in the early stages, to establish that mm -hmm. sense of confidence and trust, and, and just good practice. The more you see at a the just the better managed things are. So, um, can I add something? Sure, Scott had invited me to. Yes, uh, sure. we went exactly. We prepped together this morning, so I took notes in case he forgot something. So the one thing I wanted to add is that you know that budgeting process would probably look a little similar. We'll start in August, so that's when all this uh, in budgets started back, and 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 the, the leadership team and the administrators and the boards will work together for. It would be very similar in a way that is always what's best for kids, so the best outcomes for kids, so that equity would always be based on kids and not trying to take out of Peter to keep the ball more or, you know what I mean? So it's a culture that we will have to establish. Is it okay, Rick? Um, I just you want, want to address to... that point. Um, well, uh, what, I, what I want to avoid is, is sort of a debate um, at this point. Uh, okay, but you know, please you... don't use the equity for kids anymore. Because it really doesn't, you can say that, but if you strangle a community, believe me, you are strangling the kids in that community. And, and that you can't, you've got to look beyond an education budget, you've got to look at the impacts on these communities. And that has not been done, it's been deliberately not done in this process. So if this is going to be successful, you know, that is going to have to be crystal clear to the taxpayers, certainly in the towns that are potentially on, you know, the real short end of this stick. Yeah. Because it goes just beyond what's being spent in the school. Yeah. It's on what the families are feeling at home. It's very true, and, and this board, I think, is going to be extremely attentive to that issue. Um, I mean, most of the members are, are have been steeped in it and are, you know, wanting to make sure that we actually structure it, which is, when we get to the articles, the amendments to the articles of agreement, that, that's in part what we're striving to at least start doing with those. But I shall, with... I have one more question. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. The reimbursed expenses? Yes. Say we weren't merging. Uh -huh. Where are they in the budget? They would be over at the supervisory union. But aren't the supervisory union numbers still in those budgets? Uh, no. Uh, That's this, what we voted, right? Well, they are, well that, what <laughs> you voted is the net amount. Okay. The supervisory union would subtract the reimbursements from its budget before billing before charging the separate schools. So what um, what this does is just so it never really was transparent. Well it, it, it was before, we it. I, before the school budget ever saw it it came out. You, you could see it in the in the supervisory in the separate supervisory union um, budget. 
it was, but you would have to look over there for it, and not in the actual school budget. Um, Scott, wasn't that, wasn't there a line, an individual school budget that was our charge for the supervisor? Yes, SU assessments. Right, so that, that would have been in each town budget as an right. SU so assessment, but you'd have to go somewhere else to find the actual SU budget. Yeah, the somewhere else is in the uh, town reports. There was always the full budget for the supervisory union shown, and it showed where the revenues were there. And then it also had a line that said what were the assessment totals. So the SU budget was 9.3 million, roughly, and the assessments were a little over 4 million, and this is the difference. Because those were reimbursed by the state instead of charged to the town. My accounting would have been to show it all, right. and then show it all where you're, where you're going and where you're getting revenue from, instead of not showing it all on your assessment, right. um, it has which to is do what's with, happening here. Right? I, I understand that. It has to do with the state um, reimburses the supervisor union and not the towns, which is why that's it's a state required accounting. It's not is that something still going to happen under this whole merger. No, under the new merger, it's all one budget and it's all accumulated together. Did I answer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Next slide? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay. This is sort of uh, an overview of the changes. So there's the there's the big number at the top. Um, the expense change, the sort of the, the, the raw expense change is up 1.65%. The net impact on taxes, which is education spending um, is up 1.8, 1.83%. And then it shows the education spending per equalized pupil, which is sort of the, the, top, the, fraction, the top fraction of the education tax formula. Now, because of that per equalized pupil, the equalized pupils are going down. So that means that the education spending, even though education spending is only going up by 1.83, because the pupils are going down, that ratio, that fraction, is going up by 3.7. So in other words, you know, a little bit more than half of that 3.7 is percent increase in education spending for equal less pupil is because of declining enrollment, basically. Um, so, so Scott, my impression is normally the tax rate is set by the increase in spending per pupil from year to year. So in other words, if you spend 3.7% more on equalized spending, your tax rate should go up a commensurate amount. That's not showing this. This is showing a 1.83% increase in taxes, even though the equalized spending is going up almost double that. Well, when um, I think that the net impact on taxes is that education spending line all by itself. So, and then the um, it, the so the education spending divided by equalized pupil. You're right. That's the that's the ratio by which taxes increase. Um, but it's because of the the shrinking of that denominator that the overall ratio is, is getting bigger. Should we continue? <clears throat> All right. This is slightly more detail. I know a lot of numbers, sorry. But um, just to show the, a little bit of the breakdown. So you can see um, that the various bits and pieces that, that work together overall in this um, in this increase. So I don't want to go through it. Uh, you can read better than I can speak. So um, if we just want, to, want you to know that this information is there. And then, unless there are any questions, we can move, in at, move ahead. I have a question. Ah, yes. Just quick. Um, the previous one? No, the previous page. Uh -huh. So with staffing changes at Minus one eight two five seven three 
How many full-time equivalent positions is that? Or or part, you know, some part-time, some full-time? Any yeah. of seven? Seven? Seven were reduced. Is that the full-time position? A net of seven. Yeah. There were some um, increases. Okay. Um, there were some staffing increases associated with the fact that um, at one school could no longer get their consolidated federal grant money to support a position, and then there were some um, reductions in force. So some were peer educators and some were teachers. So that's that's the net of staffing, pluses and minuses. And the Reduction in force, that was by school, they had to decide the True. what what works for their building. Right. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. All right. Here is a, a very broad brush breakdown of the, the main divisions of the budget with you can see the the big part of it is salaries and benefits. Um, non salary but a lot of the non-salary, it is my understanding, still represents work that people are doing. So that people are getting paid for. Um, and then there's the, the debt service slash capital funding, which is 7% of the, of the budget. And the next slide shows a more uh, fine-grained breakdown of this. So, um, Again, this is something that you sh that if you're interested, you can look at in your handouts. The the main thing to um, just to recognize is the tremendous similarity between last year and, or rather, the current year and the coming this coming year budget, the one that's going to be voted on. There, um, yeah. Yeah, they're um, pretty much the, the major budget categories are, um, are very close. And in the, uh, so there's, if there are no questions on this specific slide, the next slide shows where... Oh, sorry. Uh, Corinne? Um, we didn't move this grade of slide. Um, it's in the administrative there seems rather large. How close of a look is taken to see what can happen there? Uh, yeah, um, there is a, I, I will again submit to Lori's um, correction, but um, my understanding is that the state is now defining what administrative actually means, because at present there are a number of administrative positions that are, uh, that have a lot to do with working with students. So in, in many ways they're, um, they have a kind of instructional uh, mainly instructional aspect to them. They're not just sort of back office jobs. So, um, but I, I don't know if you have anything um, more to add to that yes. one? Statewide, the state is taking a look at the chart of accounts, is what it's called, and determining for every school in the state what category fits what position. So they're giving us guidance in the fall, and they've hired a consultant to verify the definitions, and we're gonna go position by position. Mm -hmm to make sure that not only are we um, comparable in our analysis, but that it's comparable to the state. So the administrative category will be the same throughout the state and not just, um, I guess an example might be uh, a position might support instruction, what we call the administration in our school district, and it might be called instruction in another school district. So that's an example of how they're, they're re-looking at each position. So that's just kind of moving around, kind of a shell game of which wedge it's in as compared to actually reducing it in any way. I understand that, um, but I think what um, Scott was trying to say was we're trying to get a baseline of what is administration, how does it compare to the state, and, and is it really an administration or is it partially support to students, and that's, I guess, what we know today. Um, so I would also say, Corinne, that the, um, the within the administrative category, we always look at what's there um, when we build our budgets. Um, but it includes support personnel as well. It includes it includes more than just administrators in that budget. Um, and so we always look at what can we reduce in terms of 
of the support. And I know at U32, we've reduced the number of clerical positions as well over time and tried to distribute out some of the work that uh, that's done uh, in those positions to try to reduce that number over the last several years. I think you see that our reductions don't necessarily show up just in, in that piece right there, but uh, there because there weren't a whole lot of reductions last year to this year uh, budget, but <coughs> this year so, yeah. okay. this uh, the question about the two percent capital fund number. I, you know, I'm, I'm really curious to know where that comes from. I calculate that every year for the state of Vermont. We do several hundred billions. And that's your major maintenance of your capital investment. And that number is typically, when you look at it from 20,000 feet, 2% is the extreme low end of that. And it's closer to 7 what that number should be. And that's even a dangerous number to go on. You know, and that's based on not so much the budget, but it's 2 to 7% of the replacement cost of the buildings. So, you know, I'm really curious, you know, you know from my work in the past, if we ever get our hands on the capital fund so that we aren't bonding it, will have a really significant impact on our tax rate you know, in terms of stability. Mm -hmm. But you have to be realistic about putting money in. And it's yes. manageable if you do it yes. on a yearly basis. And, right? and that that's certainly a high priority of mine over the next, and the board hasn't, the merge board hasn't discussed it yet, yeah. but it will be, a, um, I think, a, you know, a, a major theme, um, among other major themes, but, but still, an important one. What is it just where the 2% comes from? Yeah, and, and you're gonna, you're gonna be even less happy when we see the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> but not yet. Oh, <laughs> this is my only chance to yeah, get this up. Uh, so number one, um, it would be lovely another year if you kept the same colors for the same items, okay? I can see that something slipped and everything kind of moved ahead one, but, you know, when you're trying to compare apples with apples, it's nice to have them all be red or whatever. Um, <laughs> and then in this current year's budget, there's a 1% for Board of Education, and I assume that's the State Board of no, Education. No, actually, that's the various different school boards. All right, um, but it doesn't it show in next year's budget. Yeah, I think this year, uh, um, and... When we go to the numbers, you'll see it's one of those itty bitty little spots. Here. Yeah. It is right here. So it's six hundred eighty-five dollars less, or no, no more. 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 Sorry, right, okay. more. Um, right, that's on the next chart, right? Yes. Okay. That's why he keeps wanting to get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Straining at the leash. Um, so you remember the the pies, the pie slices on the last chart. This shows a numerical comparison, so you can have some sense of the percentage changes. Um, Basically, they're all kind of, you know, all but one are within sort of plus minus 5%. And that one that is not, is the one that I figured you might not be happy with, Rick, um, is the capital transfer is down by 19%. And um, Lori was explaining to us, to Filoni earlier, that um, this was actually in part a kind of um, result of both Middlesex and Worcester needing to pull back from the, uh, the penalty zone, um, if I'm not mistaken, Chris. You are absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> so this is the sort of thing um, that is definitely a yellow flag that we would want to make sure that cap it's not the capital fund that gets um, rated when um, when times are tight. That <coughs> have to because over time that will lead to far greater expenses if, if we don't keep up with that. Can so, I make a suggestion? Yes. And that is that you to retain that discipline and to actually take it. We take. You know, capitalize your capital fund, but retain the interest savings in a separate account. And they're going to be substantial. Right now, I looked at the capital funds for the towns. 
and it looked like the one, the only one that could even be close to where it should be is East Montpelier. But the irony is that they've got the least liability sitting in their building. You know, and that really concerns me because mm. we all have to make, I suspect that those funds are not being spent properly and that they're not being capitalized properly. Mm. And so we need to do that, and you know, you know how to do that. I provide you with tools to do that, but simultaneously you've got to put some fiscal controls to prevent the improper use of those dollars and you to make sure that they go to the specified capital. Yes. Because the second you start pulling out of a capital fund, it's no longer a capital it's not gonna work for you. Yeah. And I've that's the number one thing that kills them yeah. everywhere is the lack of administrative you know discipline, discipline to in spending because they see a big hunk of money that they need it for something and I get that. A way to beat it is that there's one of those funds, especially when you got six schools out there, they're generating a lot of interest incomes in the years where those accounts are big. Instead of giving it back to the taxpayers, you know, put that into an account, but also have controls on that so that it gets used. It basically, you know, you have to go through some approval level to be able to do that to make sure it doesn't just get squandered because, yeah, I mean, that's what accumulate quickly. Yeah. I believe Lori is really good at that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she is. Is yeah. there a building over there? Yeah. 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 Chris, did you want to? Yeah. 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 The way, you know, if a way of doing that is to uh, basically have the capital expenditure as a separate voting item. Right. So and that our, so that every year, so that the community is going to vote a certain amount that goes into it, and then you have to get the community to say you to take it out. When I built their the catalyst capital model, that's what I recommend to the board. They didn't do it. And make it an article, separate, separate separate article, article every year. To totally, <laughs> the only things that were the only way you could take money out of it is if that was a line item in the capital fund. And if you wanted to take out for any other reason, you had to go to the taxpayers to get approval. I mean, you literally need that level of discipline because you won't get it any other way. You've got to, you know, they've got you got to keep a tight rein on these or they will be abused. And then it's you might as well have that one. But that was the commitment that Eastman Biller did back when we passed the bond six years ago. And then for now we just, we have a set amount that we know that we need to put in every year. On well, your the number looks pretty good. I'm and, guessing it's pretty we, close. Well, it's pretty close. Even though it looks large right now, that, you know, we want to make sure that we're not going to fall well, back right now, to asking yeah, the community yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is, this is great. This is going to be part of an ongoing discussion. Well, this is only 2% of the budget here, yeah. but the impacts on tax rates and are huge. And, and you don't buy. And the crowding out effect on education and spending on actually teaching yeah. children. Yeah. So um, there is no objection. Shall we move on? Oh, yeah. OK. Here's the enrollment picture. We're in a period of declining enrollment. Um, and have been for quite a long time, and who knows for how much longer. Um, there is no real um, consensus explanation for why this is happening. It's likely that there are many, many different factors at work that are kind of pulling in the same direction down. Um, but this is yet another reason why we want to I uh, keep a control on cap on bonding because uh, bonding is a great tool when you're in an expanding envi uh, population environment. The tax base is expanding, you can invest and then look forward to the uh, growing tax base to, to carry that bond. Um, but in a shrinking environment, it becomes an albatross. Um, so anyway, Education spending per equalized pupil. Um, this is, the, the left-hand column is the budgets as voted by town in March and April. The right-hand column is the merged budget. This is for, this June 25 budget is the right-hand column, education spending per pupil. Um, you can see sometimes, as you would expect for an average, sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're lower. And they 
are um, all treated alike for education spending per pupil in the MERS budget. Can you please? Can we go back to that? Just set of course, Alan. Uh, this is Alan Gilbert, by the way. I forgot to, to state my name before. So, this is a very interesting chart. Um, because what it tells you is that spending per pupil is not equal, will not be equal the next year in our unified consolidated district. Is that right? Well, <clears throat> it, it won't be equal to what it is in the town by town voted budgets. Right. Yeah. So, one of the one of the main one of the main um, goals of Act 46 is equity for kids. And in the last 25 years, equity has largely been verified by access, equal access to school funds. Now that we have equal access to school funds for everybody in all six of our schools, can we expect over time for these numbers to actually be the 18709 to be the same for everybody? So that in the kind of budget that Sandal was talking about for next year, if we do it school by school, that, um, you know, build it school by school, that that kind of um, scaffolding will show basically pretty close to the same equalized spending per pupil for every school. That's a very good question. Um, so, and just to for clarity, so what you're saying is that for each school, the number of student, equalized students times 18,000, just to use that number, uh, 18,709 would be essentially the budget for that school. Well, is that what you're getting at, or is it? No, I'm actually asking how are we going to achieve equity mm -hmm. as measured by, by money? which is how Act 60 has, has, has measured equity. So it could be the budget is done that way, but it seems to me over time, with the exception of U32, because high school students are supposed to get more money from the state. I think it's, they get 118%, I think, Laurie, as opposed to 100%. 113. One, I think the 18, Yeah, but we have, two, we have two elementary schools that are actually spending more than U32, despite the fact that U32 is supposed to get extra money because it has high school students, because high school kids are supposed to be more expensive to educate for all sorts of reasons, science labs, driver ed, whatever. Expenses are higher. So, you know, I guess the U32 is often, often a category of its own. It could presumably be allowed and should be given 13% more in funds but if we want to talk about equity among the elementary schools financially, we'd have to have the same amount per pupil. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, yeah, yet another thing to factor into the, into the equation for budget development starting in August. Can I, can I add yeah. can I, something? So um, one thing to remember is that there's three schools that you're seeing there as high spenders. E32 is pretty much done paying their bond, right? 2022. And 2022. And uh, East Montpelier and Middlesex and Berlin. So, and this are numbers that we were not able to totally finalize today when we were doing numbers with, with Laurie. But for example, in East Montpelier, there's $2,900. Uh, there, that is just the debt, part of the debt. So once you take the debt out of Berlin and Middlesex, all of them come down a little bit. You see what I mean? So, so it's not just the, it, it's not just the spending for for school. You can correct me okay. for but for, for programs. So you can't take the debt out because the numbers are right here. Town of Callis is getting sixteen thousand seven hundred twenty yes. dollars per equalized pupil. It's the lowest in this group, but we are paying the largest tax increase, 12%. And more than that, and, no, and, not and but my point that's is that that is that some, some of this difference. We're paying that bond debt. 
Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to separate it because the built environment is, it also affects the kids, so it's part of the whole thing. What I'm saying is that there's there's other schools that don't have that right now, so we're not really comparing. So this is this houses. is looking backward from the past year, and, and there is a debt factor in the schools that have debt, but you're absolutely right that yeah. debt is going to be a, an ongoing factor. Well, the debt yeah, is going to be you got to look at two different. You can't just look at this table. You got to look at the tax rates. Right. You know, right. and, and you know, we're essentially paying for the difference. Where is the equity in this? Well, and we will we will actually be able to look at that um, in greater uh, detail coming up on our next. Yeah. Um, so this is this is basically just the usual list of the four horsemen of the. Education tax rate. Um, the uh, it, it's a it's a multi-story fraction basically. There's education spending at the top, divided by equalized pupils, divided by you know property dollar property and income dollar yield. Is that about right? And then that, that is all divided by the common level of appraisal. So. Um, uh, it's oh, and it, and before it's divided by the common level of appraisal, it's multiplied by the statewide education tax rate. So is that pretty much right? Great. I can't believe I got it right. <laughs> 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 You've been working on it for years. For years. years. <laughs> I know it's so true. Um, so anyway, I guess thank you. The common level of appraisal is always sort of um, represents, uh, it always seems to feel like the, the last kick in the pants um, for tax purposes. Um, you'll see the following chart. Um, basically, all of the CLAs, all of the common levels of appraisal are declining. And because the tax rate, the CLA is a denominator a declining CLA means a higher rate. So um, you can see here, you, you might, again, this is another one you want to consult your, um, your handouts on. But this, <coughs> I think, you know, you can see who gets walloped. Middlesex gets it hardest. I think Callus maybe, and um, Worcester to a degree as well. Um, and Berlin, not so badly. And East Montpelier, not so terribly either. So, um, <coughs> yeah. Um, if you're having trouble getting to sleep tonight, <laughs> this, remember this. Um, so this is, a, this is a detail. We've put it in because it, it's, it, it can be, it's, a little on the technical side, but it's important to have in mind. It's, it's always a factor that I know you just saw me almost forget to mention it. But, um, George, did you want to say anything? It, no, it just it reminded me why it's why we're not properties for selling. Not everybody knows that. Oh, the CLA. Oh, for the, the CLA. CLA. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and part, of the, part of the problem with the CLA is that I guess it's a rolling average over three years. And um, even a rolling average over three years, in some of our towns, so few houses sell from year to year that they're trying to do a statistical operation with uh, like a microscopic sample. And it's, it's bound to kind of do crazy things, um, even averaged over three years. OK, now, here's where we get to um, sort of the tax details. Once again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on this, but this, this chart on your handouts, this is from the votes, the budgets that were voted in March and April, the town by town, or school by school, I should say, to include U32. School by school budgets in March and April. And so you get the combined impact on residential tax rate you should use that as the baseline when you um, compare 
with the merge rate, which is, voila. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is basically the same, um, the same chart showing the merge rate. So you have to kind of move back and forth. Uh, Callus is the only example that I can remember off the top of my head, which the original increase would have been 4.2 um, cents in the town voted budget. In this one, it's 0.123. So the difference is 8.1 8, 8 cents, um, uh, an increase of 8.1 cents. So you can you can work out um, what that what that difference is for um, for your town um, from stinks. Yeah. We have some of the lowest spending for equalized people, and yet we're paying an exorbitant high tax rate. Yeah. Um, I mean, I want to support this budget. Yeah, know. this is, okay. But, um, I, there are a few things to go before, before you can fire torpedoes. <laughs> um, okay, uh, income sensitivity. This is another one. Um, Insomnia, no problem. Um, this is sort of a, again, you can refer back to this. Um, there's a range of uh, both uh, town, town by town, and income segment by income segment for income sensitivity, which is a kind of analgesic, I suppose, for um, some of these tax increases. So, yeah, and here's another one that you may want to um, refer to. We've got a lot of these that you can take home and enjoy. Um, the, the interesting part here for me, uh, just from a kind of socioeconomic standpoint, you can see the, the sort of the, the bottom third of income is on the, the left-hand side. So, so you see that um, the properties capped with income below 47K. Um, Callis has 25%, Worcester has 22, Berlin 15, East Montpelier 14, Middlesex 13. And then if you go to the middle zone, the middle segment, um, you know, they're relatively close in terms of how much you know, the share of the middle in each town. And then when you move over to the, to the far right, you can see, you know the, um, you know the high high end of the income spread. Those who are not sensitized, income sensitized, who are paying full freight on their um, properties, and how many of what proportion of the people are, are there? Um, in Rick, I mean again, this just adds fuel to the fire. I mean you can see a lot of the neediest peoples are in the towns getting hit the hardest, again, where is the equity? Here is, I mean, I'm just astounded. And I am not holding you accountable or anyone in this room. Our legislators should be shoveling manure out of, <laughs> you know, this is this uh, is unbelievably bad policy in this all. I mean, this, this is a travesty. How does it help students to have their parents stressing way more than callous over their taxes? Well, How does the, it help the students? Yeah, well, the one, the one thing about it, I think part of the message of this slide is that the lower end is getting sensitized, is not getting um, taxed in the same proportion. Um, they're, you know what I'm talking about? So, yeah, well, I, the lower, they're. Who is paying? That's what I, I think so. Yeah, you know, there's still you know, a difference in yeah. probably I. And how much difference does it make? The three people yeah. I know who are in that first column get a minuscule amount yeah. off. I mean, it's, it's it's enough for a box of cereal and some meat. It's just, it's nothing. Yeah. I mean, it um, sounds good, but it works out to be nothing. Yes. I'm trying, oh, Corinne. Um, Corinne, Berlin, I didn't say that before. Um, so it's really painful to talk to residents and taxpayers when any of them that have really been following along 
to know that Act 46 was first tooted back in 2015 as it would save us money and to see that taxes are going up. So what is it that can be said to them in light of this as far as, you know, will there be any cutbacks whether in salary or personnel at central office because there's fewer meetings to prepare for? Are there other cost saving things that are being looked at? Because we all know this budget is just kind of like honest, just as the way things unfolded. But as far as what people are looking toward next year, yeah. you know, is there any little light at the end of the tunnel that I can point out to people? Um, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, uh, can, I, I, I think the, the only light at the end of the tunnel is is basically us and our um, effort and good. <laughs> um, as Flora mentioned, we're going to start digging into this as early as August, and with you know trying to see where um, where there might be ways to to take advantage of this without sacrificing the good things that we have. Um, but I would just suggest oh, the gentleman in the front. Yes. Can you take advantage of his knowledge, your board members? Oh, yeah. I mean, yes. I know about You're not up there? Not on this board. I'm well, on Catholic board. Well, what I mean is, as this current, the new board starts working on all of this, pick everybody's brain. Oh, absolutely. Because, We're, we will. We will because that, that, to me, I have noticed over the last several months, that hasn't been happening. It's been kind of a closed thing going on here, and we all of a sudden find out what's happening. Yeah. That's because pick, pick the we're, we're that pick yeah. Their brains. <laughs> yeah, um, I have to confess that I've the amount that I've we're basically doing a lot of improvising as we go and trying to uh, being driven on a on an inhumane it's sort of like a um, death march timetable. Um, but I, I was everything that goes wrong is all your fault. Uh, that's, that's the whole point. That's why I'm here. <laughs> well, Scott, I think, yes. Go ahead, Sorry, Dorothy. I, I was just going to say the other thing is that um, it, it brought home to me again Monday night when we had the carousel meeting. And until now, we have had 32 board members to deal with all the issues or projects or whatever in our district. Now we have 10. So you can see why we sort of feel like we're being, it, it doesn't seem clear to you because we're trying to get our feet under ourselves and stand up and do the work. The other thing that I want to say, um, sorry, as far as the U32 board um, goes, you know, we came up with a really fiscally responsible budget. Um, we had to cut positions. Um, you know, we revisited this multiple times um, so I, I, you know, it's not really us, per se, um, that that you're going to end up being upset with because we did spend the time to do what we had to do, and you know, and we had budgets that passed. Um, so that being said, we tried to do those things that you're talking about, and but and, and and positions have been cut, and administration positions have been you know switched around at least on on our level. Um, so, you know, it, it's not like it hasn't happened. And maybe it wasn't this year, but it was last year or the, or the year prior. So, I, you, you know, it, you can't beat us up because of what we've come up with um, for a budget. Well, I was going to say, it, it hasn't been a tight time frame in the sense of the four years of public meetings and Act 46 discussions and the committees that started there were a lot of public meetings and discussion, and um, it didn't come out to a point where people voted for some of what were supposed to be tax breaks. I don't know that they would have been, but since November, when it became known that we had to have something by June 30th, it may feel like it's been crushed or tightened, the time frame. But there really has been a long time of Act 46 discussion and public meetings it's and information. It's been an eternity. It has. <laughs> and it hasn't been easy. Yeah. And it hasn't always been, uh, well, it, there's nothing easy yeah. about it over those years of a lot of frustration and a lot of public input. 
So I think the it may feel that way right now, but th there has been reams of notes over the last four years over this process. That's true. Over the process, but not over cobbling together a unitary budget, no. uh, which has complications and impacts uh, that we did not grapple with because we were looking for the alternative governance structure which would maintain the local board. So uh, this year will be uh, enlightening and difficult, uh, to say the least, um, just because you're going to have the um, same amount of money but much more different competing interests amongst the different um, the, the, the needs that need to be served. Yes, I think. Yeah, to say the least. Thank you, Chris. Rick. You know, the, pro the problem with this isn't the budget. The school boards have done a tremendous job, all of them, in developing this. And Lori, I mean, my God, they've, they've, I've been involved with that. And they've been, they're heroic efforts. The problem is in the mandate and the change that was directed by Act 46. We don't see our politicians sitting in this room. And Lindy talked about all the process. I was there. Scott and I have been in this longer than anybody in this room. Since before Act 46, Act 46, we were lobbying against that ourselves. And that, we've been there all along this conversation. In the beginning, it was really set up as a one-size-fits-all model, and it was a railroad process. When we tried to create an alternative governance system, it was denied. And you know what were the, the outcomes that we're seeing on these tables were preordained outcomes by incompetent legislative activity. And I'm going to call it what it is. You know, I don't speak easily this is way. judgment for his own way. Well, no, 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 no. Judgment, it, it was on the part of the AOE, whoever, you know, Rebecca Holcomb, who created this, and the legislature. And you know, you were in this, Scott. They very much directed and even misled us through this process saying the towns had input, when in fact they didn't. We are really ending up with exactly what they said at the beginning. And I will name names, Tony Klein and Kent and, you know, and good. Janet good. Ansel good. and Ann Cummings all said, you're going to have flexibility. We were not given that flexibility. And so now we're caught, you know, how are these numbers going to fix themselves? And let's say we vote this budget down, which I'm certainly going to vote against well, ethically, but you know, the, at the meeting just the other night, the answer that the unified board gave or how we'll just keep submitting the budget until they pass it. Now, is that <laughs> democratic yeah. process? It, 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 it sounds it, like there's going to be a union debate for well, the whole city. Yeah. I, um, yeah. It, anyway, well, should we look at the next slide? Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Senators did. Only Anthony Polino is the one that did not. So, you know, certain legislatures at the time it passed because there's, there's been changes since then. But very few because some of them we put right back in. Kim Jessup was all over the place. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. Just, so, I, I just want to say that you know, and I, I don't want to be contrary, but that one of the things that that we're not doing with this vote in my mind is fighting. Like we were elected to this consolidated board to to keep doing what what we had said as board members that we wanted to do and what we we're gonna do for next year budget, right? Stay with our mission, our vision, our implementation plan, trying to reduce the achievement gap, but trying to base our our decisions and the information that we're getting from. Like that's our that's our job, you know, students learning. And, but it, if there's a fight to be fought, and I've said this to Scott before, if there, you know, there's a different arena for that. Like, to me, what we are doing here today is, is, is for the kids and it's for the budget. And, you know, and I know that the tax numbers are, are, are horrible, but with this, with this <coughs> vote, we don't, you know, it, vote however you want to vote, but just remember that it, it's about what we all did, I hear is, is honoring that the hard work of all the different boards and the time that they took to put what is best. For, and I'm, I don't mean this in a bad way because I know you don't like me hearing the kid thing, 
But what, what all you, but to me, in my mind, all you are doing is honoring the work of the board members that you elected. That's all I'm going to say. Summary. Um, summary. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is the first of two public hearings. Um, the second one is going to be on Monday. Uh, when we do these, no public hearing is exactly like any other public hearing. So um, if you if you have if you find yourself with questions in the meantime, if um, if you just want to if you just have you know want to make points um, that you think we need to hear in order to be able to do our jobs in future, whatever should happen to this budget. I uh, would love it if you were to come um, and to send your friends, neighbors, family. Um, this again in your handout, all your um, contact info. Uh, I think, you know, this is really hard. For, for me, personally, it's really hard. I think from the point of view of the allocation of resources to the schools, this budget is about the best that we can get um, because you know it's been arrived at by people who know what they're doing, um, who really care, who know their schools, and have worked it out in such a way to get where they got. Um, and we've just taken those, and as Fuller said, we're, we're honoring that work by combining these budgets together. On the other hand, as has been said many times here, and as I feel myself very acutely, I think that the allocation of, um, of costs to taxpayers in a fair and equitable manner is terrible. Um, so my own having thought through this, anguished over this, my own sense is um, a little bit of God, I can't believe I'm agreeing with the Lord. Um, what's happening to me? <laughs> I'm sure we will again. Um, that this budget is probably the wrong battlefield to fight the fight. That, it, from my by my estimation, if we try to if we try to fight the state on this, we'll we'll lose. My own sense is that um, the agency of education, the legislature, they don't really care. They're, um, they feel that they have the upper hand and we'll, that we'll just break our spear tips on, on that, you know, um, adamantine surface. Um, if only it were adamant instead. Um, but there's nothing we're able to hold on. You've well, never been able to vote. no. You know what, Scott? I have I have completely, I've completely messed up because the articles, the amendments to the articles of agreement, which we can run. Quick. Oh, thank you, thank you, Lori. Lori is magic. Um, this this is what um, Rosemary was um, talking about quite rightly. Um, the budget ballot. Is, is very simple, clear, not a, it doesn't pose any technical problems for voters, I don't think, I hope. Just yes or no. Yes. Just yes or no. These articles are much more complicated. The only way we're going to get people to, to be able to vote intelligently on these is to prepare them really well. And we're doing this, I mean, um, a bunch of people here put a lot of time and effort, including Floor and Chris and Dorothy, um, into amending these articles, coming up with text that will provide going into the merger, the same way that Callis, you know how Callis changed the, the um, easements and um, you know, this, the property use agreement in order to convey with the property. This is a way of conveying um, with the district if, if you know, this thing continues. So Article 1 is basically about giving 
um, if, if you want the town to have veto power, that, it, pardon me, quick, correct me if I mangle this too badly. If you want your town to have veto power over this board closing your school, or the voters of the five town district closing your school, vote yes on the first article of this. And article two, that's the three year terms? Yes. Uh, um, no, it's the uh, right, adding five more adding members. Five more members. Three year terms, three Right, five, yeah, three, sorry. Three people per town. Three people per town, thank you. Yeah. If you want um, three people per town instead of the present two, vote yes on the second article. Um, yeah, the, the third. Article of the third. Uh -oh. It's not on my slide. Oh, it's probably another page. Yeah, <laughs> the next page. Okay. I have a hard copy. Oh, right, right, right. Right. If you want, if you want to tell this board to encourage to to create structures for greater public participation, vote yes on the third article. Um, it's right to it's right there. If you want to see that, that's right there. Oh, and great. four and five. Thanks. Sorry, it's not on the third. No, 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 that's quite all right. Um, all right, okay, Scott, may I interrupt? Please. Yeah. The article one and two are in the default state articles and we are amending them. But the next three, I think, are, are, new, ones, are right? new articles, and it's prefaced with the word tentative, because we haven't accepted them yet. So don't let that word work. Yeah. If you see tentative, yeah. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so who added, uh, who added article 15, 18, and 19? Is that state or you no, know, This is all us. Right. All of these amendments are us. Okay. All the amendments and the new articles are our own work. Yeah. Right. So David Lawrence Middle said, so the state I'm gonna uncharacterly say cram down their model on us and these are all modifications to the state model. Just right. Yes. Okay. So well, there might be done there too. A lot of articles were not allowed to be amended in any way. Correct. Well, right. yeah. We have very limited ability. They did a great job in trying to work through this. But, you know, we didn't, there wasn't good flexibility. I mean, this was definitely forced on it. Yeah. Okay. Sandal and then Yeah, I'm sorry. No. Um, so you're adding articles 15 and 18 and 19. What do, you, what do I know about articles 16 and 17? Are they something that I, I don't see them anywhere? Yeah, that's because they're not being changed. changed. They're, they're default, they're, but they're just... Not something I can no, read. 16 and 17 no. are this, it's just, so article four, uh, the article that they gave us was up to 14, and then this article right. 18, 16, okay. and but, 17. But 16 and 17 aren't in any, aren't in the packet that I got from the town clerk, so. Are they still posted somewhere online where, you know, yeah. I don't know what they are. I think it's not, the state default article is not stopped at 14. Yeah, right. they, they stop oh, at 14. Can I see your... Yeah, you might have the yeah. So this this is what I got yeah. from the from town clerk. clerk. And there's no article 16 or 17. They call this this one is eight. Uh, yeah, eight yeah, seven. that's old. Yeah, that's old okay. news. Well, yeah. our town clerk. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll, um, we can say, we'll, I, said, yeah. I have your address handle. I'll send you the article. So are there are there articles 16 and 17 sitting somewhere? They're on the right ballot. Right. They're right out there. Yeah. Oh, what yeah. happened? Oh, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a numbering. Oh, there's she. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> this one is 16 and 17. So you know what it is? The the kind of articles one, two, six. And Juan, Juan, just asking about numbers. So don't worry about the numbers. We <laughs> <laughs> said this was going to be consensus. Well, this is the actual ballot. Yeah, but I don't see that until I get to the poll. Yeah, it's on the website. Adjusted. The ballot, there's a copy ballot. of the ballot on okay. the town website. Again, as, you know, I was a teacher, I structured a lot of educational information, 
And all I can say <laughs> is that instead of calling the things that we're voting on and filling in the little circles, Article 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then within Article 1, you have to talk, you have to go to the next packet and find Article 4. And then you go back to Article 2, and you've got to go back to Article 7 or whatever. And here, it's a very poor um, juxtaposition of an article that you're voting on changing another article that has nothing to do with that numbering system. I agree. And if it had been me as a teacher, I would have said item one or topic one, topic two, topic three, topic four. That's what you're going to vote on. And they refer to the articles in the bigger packet. Yeah. But when I sat down with this, it took me a few minutes to get <laughs> them yeah, we, we aligned with each other. Uh, David, before you do go, what? Uh, 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 are the towns going to mail out the sample ballots like we have for things in the past? Yeah. No, they didn't have time really. No. The ballots just weren't ready in time for it. Yeah. They're posted in the usual places. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So the stores yeah. and like, yes. yeah. First, about her article comment. Yeah. That's the way the ballots have to be Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. We don't have a choice. That's the way they have to be. Right. It just confused me. I know. It is. <laughs> I have a question about, I don't know which article it is because I don't have it right in front of me. Uh -huh. Adding the three people. Yeah. Well, that's the second article, second. two, okay. which is. Yeah. Why, I think it's within that article, you want to commingle ballots. Well, of course. Doesn't it say that, commingle ballots in that yeah. article? Yeah. We have to. We have okay. To. Why didn't you put in there commingling the budget ballots? Because they're not commingled. They're not? No. I don't. You we cannot commingle the budget make a motion for it. Technically, the individual voting callus goes into the callus tabulator, and that result is available. And that um, result is available. And I think, that, I think that's uh, in the article. That's in the article. I think that's in yeah, the that's default article. There's two. Because yeah. we talked about that, how that was not an easy thing. Yeah. To be commingled. Interesting. Because four other dis unified districts have changed theirs. To say we co mingle into a specific line or anywhere. Yeah, co mingle the budget ballots. But they don't co mingle their election. Matter of fact, they don't even hold an election district wide. They hold it in their own town. Before that, I look but, but that might be because this is a hybrid model. Um, and in order for each of the towns to have the same number of representatives in the uh, on the new board, you had to have uh, so that everyone in the district could vote for. Uh, those representatives from the particular towns. I suspect that those towns that do not have a district wide meeting for I representatives right. have proportional, more strictly proportional representation so that you know, a larger town would have more representatives than a smaller town. And so by, by having the same number of representatives for each town in this new entity, um, in order for that to pass constitutional uh, review, um, everyone had to be able to vote on the representatives that were on the ballot, even though they're from a different town than where you live. So is there a reason why you didn't put in to call me on the budget? Um, I, because I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that can happen. happen. If the budget fails, we consider ourselves lucky that school's out. Because the reason why your 32 budget is co-mingled is, so, is so that if it would fail in one town, we would know it, yeah. so it didn't come back on the kids later. And I, that does happen, no matter what anybody says, it does happen. Mm -hmm. And by commingling the budget, nobody knows which town might vote it down. Yeah. And now we're going to. I On Tuesday, know. we're going to know <laughs> which it down. Somebody comes back on my kids, it could be more than five it, it, I, I served on, on the elementary school board back in the early 90s, and it happened to my own children, so, yeah. because the budget was going down. Yeah. So we need to co you need to look at that commingling yeah. that budget, yeah. because that's really important. For the kids. If we're doing this for the kids, let's do it for the kids. Yeah. And that's one piece we can. Thank you very much for that. Um, note taken, for sure. Rick? That was an excellent point. Uh, but can, and, I don't, and this is a difficult thing to do, and I don't know if it's, this, 99% of the people are not going to be able to understand these articles and what they're voting. It's a reality. So we're going to get the both in there. Is there a way that you, as a board, and all of you, have worked really hard 
over the years to do this correctly. A tremendous amount of work's been put into these. I mean, if you could write a summary recommendation on how to vote on each of these, or, or something that really briefly, I mean, yes. this would yes. be, and I know that there's kind of an ethical issue with that. Yeah. People yeah. need this. I don't think you can yeah. how advocate as a board member, advocate for You can say, get out and vote. This is what it will mean. But I don't think you can say, please come out. How can you do it? There's got this to be is, a way. Actually, I think Chris has just put his finger on it. If we, had a, if we could do a cheat sheet, like what you're saying, one liner, a yes vote means boom, no, boom. Yeah, that would be each one. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's not an advisory, not but a predictive. It, well, like it's a, that, oh, okay. Yeah, that you, you were describing with the impact of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The people okay. need this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you could go and write something. <laughs> <laughs> we could. Well, I don't know these well enough, too. I, but I need help from Chris McVeigh. Right. I mean, honestly, I want to make sure I was giving good advice on it. And I've been involved with this a long, well, you know, for five years now. So it's like, uh, you know, we, you know, this needs to be right where people are voting and right where they can see it. But is it is it going to work in yeah. this format? I'm Maybe. worried about the budget. I'm even more worried about these guys. I am too. I'm really worried Especially about Especially what's going to confuse them is that there's an A and a B, but they only have one yes and one no, and they're going to want to vote yes or no on both of them. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Those guys of things. Um, no, people are already voting. The absentee yeah. voting, yeah. it is taking place. Ballots yeah. have been received back. Yeah. That's probably going to be some of the strongest part of the voting because these votes that have been happening, there just hasn't been a lot of turnout. It's just not happening. Yeah. If this from Orca is posted by the weekend, there's a chance that a few more people will be able to watch it. You know, but like the, the next meeting that you have on the 24th, Berlin people have our own local meeting about easements. So people would, that are inclined to go out to the meeting will have to choose which one to go to. So there just isn't a lot of time. Basically, anything that isn't getting pushed out before the end of this week, it isn't doing much of any good. Thank you for making me feel very <laughs> <anxious>. Sorry, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're right. Scott, the one, I, you know, I, I think people vote for or against any budget or articles of agreement based on two factors. One is their understanding of, of what, what is before them. And then the second factor is whether they favor whatever that is. I don't feel I have an understanding yet of how the budget works. And the part that I don't understand particularly is the revenue raising part. And that's too, it's, I think it's too difficult a subject to get into tonight. But it would really help, I think, for the next meeting on Monday, if there are any of us who show up again, to, to, to have a better understanding of how the money is being raised. Because I, I don't know if, if we're moving to a system like U32 has used for, I think, its entire existence, where schools are billed according to the percentage of students they have at the school. You know, mm -hmm. it, you, it's essentially a tuition type system. Uh, I, I don't know if we're using that. I don't know if we're using that for the high school, but not for the elementary. I don't understand any any of the revenue side, and that 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 worries me because I don't like voting for things I don't understand. What, what do you mean by revenue? Uh, um, you know how. I don't want to get into um, deep in the weeds, but. Well, you know how right now it's based on equalized pupils. Yeah, yeah. In the future. It, it's town by town. They're all. They're no longer equalized pupils from East Montpelier. Or equalized pupils. There'll be a mass of equalized, pupils. Be a mass of equalized yeah. pupils with one um, education right. spending rate. So it sounds as though somehow the property tax base will then become the maybe. I don't know. This is a very advanced question. Advanced <laughs> topics in education and finance. Seminar. Yeah, well, I, um, we know attendees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, David. Yeah, David Lawrence, Middlesex. Um, this is actually a tangential question, but it should be brief. Does anybody happen to know 
whether with Act 46 there's anything in there that says that five years from now we'll be able to evaluate whether any of the goals of going through <laughs> no. this exercise They won't give us any money to do it. There's no evaluation. That was one of the things that the legislators were sort of talking about, but never kind of got around to. Because I kind of wonder if in five years after we said, yeah, we tried it, it was awful, let's go back the way it was. No. There's nothing there, there is another thing about the articles you need to understand is that whatever board is in place, there is a mechanism for them to change those articles. I think it requires the electorate to vote on the changes, but it doesn't mean these are in concrete forever. 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 Yeah. So we didn't have enough votes right now, but this is something that we all really believe, and we want three members. So we can, this is an, not an easy, easy, but this is something that we all want to work on, and there mm -hmm. might be more that we want to bring over. So yeah, we consider these amendments to be protections, mm -hmm. enhanced protections to the extent we can provide them. Scott. Just thank you for reminding me of all this confusion, but there is something I can work on. And thank you, Nate, for I, I really like what you come up with. And it's, it's worth voting on. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you're voting. I, I hope that there are more like you out there. Um, Rick? Yeah, I mean, and I appreciate everything and everyone's done in this room. Boy, that, there's a lot of hard effort that's gone into a situation that you just cannot. I mean, this is now in the political realm, and this means changing legislature. I mean, we, the only way to fix this problem is to go the way Maine did. We're just going to have to throw people out and do it legislatively. I mean, you, that is really the only recourse at this point. I mean, yeah, we've, been, we've been we've been other arena, as she kind of euphemistically <laughs> put it. Well, this is where we're going to be putting our effort, because... I mean, this is an act of five years of incompetence and deaf ears uh, on, and that, this is very scary what this is doing, but basic Vermont governance policy, and, and this goes way beyond education. If they're doing it here, they're doing it in other places, mm -hmm. and this is a, this is a very plan, fast way to end up with, like in generic suburbia, you know, we're giving up rights that have been very good. <coughs> Yeah. <clears throat> thank, thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, um, Peter. I, Peter Harvey and Callis. I, I would just like to say that this has been much more interesting and informative. In addition to what you've done, to what everyone back here has is, is either made comments with or asked questions about and had a discussion with, without this audience, it wouldn't have been. It would have been terrible, I can guarantee you. Mm -hmm. It's really the audience. So I appreciate it. I applaud all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I learned a lot more because of, of this, this golden mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel a lot more anxious because of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys have made a great difference in certain subjects.